Thank you. Uh, the first item of business is a member's business debate on motion 18... Well, it's not the first item, it's the last item of business, is a member's business debate on motion 18139, the name of Ian Gray, on celebrating the International Year of the Periodic Table. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask the members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons? And I call on Ian Gray to open the debate. Mr Gray, please. Thank you uh, very much, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to lead this debate on the uh, International Year of the Periodic Table, celebrating the 150th anniversary of uh, Mendeleev's first real periodic table as we know it today. Uh, and of course, also marking science in the Parliament Day, which has been taking place uh, across the road in Dynamic Earth. Now, any of the chemistry teachers I worked with decades ago when I was a physics teacher would probably think it a little ironic that I'm bringing this debate to Parliament because with all the hubris of the young, uh, I would then cheerfully disparage chemistry as a discipline, arguing that it was little more than footnotes to physics or worse, a kind of cookery with recipes. You should hear what I used to say about biology. Uh, now, with the wisdom of age, uh, I know that I was talking rubbish, uh, and the periodic table is indeed the central proof of that, because this was a real scientific revolution in the sense that uh, after the philosopher Thomas Kuhn, we know natural science progresses. After all, for centuries, science had operated on the idea of four elements, air, earth, fire, and water, ideas which had not changed since Aristotle. So when Mendeleev built on the work of Priestley, Lavoisier, and our own Joseph Black and John Newlands uh, to publish in 1869 a new table of the known elements according to atomic weight and valence, it was the final transition from the age of alchemy to the age of chemistry, a scientific revolution as dramatic as Copernican astronomy, Newton's mechanics or Einstein's relativity. And like so many of those, it, it had an element of intuitive insight about it. Mendeleev claimed to have dreamed the table with only uh, one correction to be made. And its structure apparently reflected his love of playing patience with cards. The table is a genuine scientific paradigm because it allows predictions to be made in this case, of then undiscovered elements. Mendeleev himself used it to predict the existence and properties of germanium, gallium, and scandium, uh, although once again he reached for his mystical side, giving them names from Sanskrit. Others, of course, uh, followed in those footsteps, including Scott Sir William Ramsay, who predicted and then discovered the noble gases, uh, for which he received the Nobel Prize in 1902. And newer elements have, of course, uh, since been created in the lab. The most recent, Organison, only confirmed in 2016. And then, too, uh, although the periodic table has had many representations, as a spiral, a circle, a cube, or a cylinder, the periodic table is universal, and it is fundamental. Uh, as the American science writer Sam Keane puts it, Everywhere in the universe, the periodic table has the same basic structure. Even if an alien civilization's table weren't plotted out in the castle with turret shape we humans favor, their spiral or pyramidal or whatever shaped periodic table would naturally pause after 118 elements. So, that includes then the world's oldest surviving periodic table, which was discovered not so long ago in the chemistry department at St Andrews University, or the periodic table made of light being projected uh, as we speak, I hope, uh, onto Edinburgh University's David Hume Tower just up the road. Or indeed, to the macrame interpretation of the table displayed by the Royal Society of Edinburgh over the summer, comprising uh, over 200,000 knots representing the scarcity and vulnerability of the elements as well as their properties. Not quite chemistry through interpretative dance, but chemistry through crochet. The periodic table then is a great icon, a powerful tool, and a symbol not just of the structure of nature, but of our capacity to describe the universe 
in which we live. Yet, if it is to be of more than historical interest, there are serious challenges we must face. A high quality education in chemistry and other STEM subjects accessible to as many as possible is absolutely vital. Ensuring future generations can stand on the shoulders of giants of Scottish chemistry like Black and Ramsay and move the science on. Yet chemistry is exactly one of those subjects badly impacted by the squeeze on the number of subjects pupils can take in the senior phase of school and the consequent narrowing of the curriculum. It has suffered too uh, from a shortage of teachers qualified and willing to teach the next generation of chemists. We cannot allow this to continue if we care about science. Meanwhile, many of the rarest elements have become the most critical to our daily lives in devices such as mobile phones uh, or electric cars. Indeed, natural sources of at least six of the elements in mobile phones are set to run out in the next 100 years or so. And while this goes on, 82% of households are not even thinking about recycling old electronic devices uh, such as phones. Meanwhile, 60% of the world's supply of cobalt used in batteries comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo, where men, women, and children as young as six work and die in unspeakable conditions to mine it for 50 pence a day. What a tragedy it would be if our generation failed to educate the successors to those pioneers of the periodic table, or instead of discovering the elements, let some of them disappear from the earth enslaving thousands on the way. For 150 years, the periodic table has been a force for good, an instrument of knowledge, powering human progress. Let's do what we have to, to make sure it is that again for the next 150 years too. Thank you very much. And I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Brian Whittle. Mr. Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. Um, I don't know what my chemistry teacher would uh, have said about me, probably wasn't very flattering. In fact, Bert Sheath, for it was he, whenever an experiment was taking place in the, in the lab, used to leave the room, stand just outside the door and peer inside. So afraid was he of the potential results uh, of his students. Um, and I think that was entirely attributable to the students, not to any deficiencies in his teaching. Uh, poor Bert had previously been blown up in an experiment and didn't want to repeat uh, that uh, once again. I think Ian Gray, too, touched on something very important in relation to science, um, that it does not stand alone uh, when we talk of uh, subjects like this from moral and social issues. And I think he was entirely right uh, to talk about the conditions uh, that we are depending on for much of our technology uh, in countries such as Congo uh, and uh, elsewhere. Lithium, too, I think, is something that is extracted in quite appalling uh, conditions and which electric cars are going to depend on unless we change the technology. Now, this has been an excellent opportunity, uh, perhaps for my two interns, uh, who this morning I asked uh, to prepare some speaking notes uh, for today. They are both uh, interns with limited scientific knowledge and it's quite, always quite interesting how much they can discover in a short space of time. Um, so I, like others, will thank Ian Gray for providing the opportunity uh, to discuss the periodic table. Uh, it's one of these visual things that sticks in your memory from your education, even if the detail escapes you. Uh, the shape is something that will stick with you. It's a rich uh, tool uh, for teaching and remembering uh, what uh, it means. It is, of course, to me as a mathematician, a very humble and poor mathematician, I hasten to add, um, one of the great things in chemistry because it has a symmetry and a pattern uh, which uh, lends itself uh, to, uh, to mathematicians in particular. Um, my assistant, uh, my interns Claire and Anna, 
uh, identified uh, Sir William Ramsay as well and found that he was described as one of the greatest chemical discoverers of the time. And I've always thought it was a particularly um, notable achievement for someone back in 1894 to discover uh, a chemically inert gas because how do you detect it when it doesn't interact uh, with anything else? And they, they, they tell me that when he named it Argon, he did so because that is the Greek name for lazy, because as a gas, it did not uh, have any chemical properties that were particularly uh, notable. But of course, having discovered one uh, noble gas, he then went on to discover another three, uh, and that was absolutely excellent. And that's an example of Scotland uh, being a leader in scientific discovery. But of course, Ian Gray correctly identified that that didn't happen out of nowhere. It happened because we had a well-educated population who took an interest in philosophical and scientific matters. Uh, we are only about uh, 500 meters from the memorial to David Humes uh, in the old Colton Cemetery at the top of the hill next to the government building. Uh, in fact, uh, celebrating one part of our achievement. Um, we have at the end of George Street, we have Maxwell, there's a new statue to him. So we celebrate uh, our achievements, but we must have a new bank of highly skilled STEM literate employees, and it must be men and women. If we fail to engage uh, the females uh, of our, our race, uh, then we miss out on 50% of that uh, terrific intellect that there is uh, there. The periodic table gives us a universal language to talk about elements and molecules, helps us uh, to catalyze and synthesize scientific uh, knowledge and excellence, and of course is something that is used around the world. Um, it's something that promotes joint progress because we have a, a shared model, and collaboration is always going to be something that's of a value uh, in science. I very much uh, welcome the opportunity to uh, recognize the momentous contribution of the periodic table, acknowledge the importance of its continuing in scientific development and education. I must say in the science uh, wing of the school that I attended, um, my favorite thing was always the Van de Graaff generator, which you could charge yourself up to a million volts and then go and discharge on other people to their great shock and alarm. But I do remember the periodic table. It is immensely valuable uh, to us and will be to others. Presiding officer. I'm not going to comment. Uh, call Brian Whittle, followed by Liam MacArthur, please, Mr. Whittle. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I thank Ian Gray for bringing this debate to the Chamber and allowing me the luxury of being a complete nerd. So, so disappointed and surprised that the Chamber would empty but just because we are speaking about the periodic table. I would remind the, the, the Chamber that a long, long time ago, um, I was actually an industrial chemist, uh, and I do love this kind of chemistry, how elements were formed, how we're all children of the stars, because every element that forms in the world around us, everything we see, everything that has ever been or will be, uh, was formed at the centre of giant stars. Clouds of hydrogen gas, coalescing under the pressures of gravity until that ball of gas is so massive that it spontaneously bursts into life as a nuclear fusion reaction, burning hydrogen as fuel. And as hydrogen is burned, helium is formed, giving off heat at more than 5,000 degrees Celsius. The star is hot enough now to fuse helium into carbon. And it's when this continued fusion pro uh, it produces iron that the star's life ends. At this point, the chemical reaction that has been pushing out against gravity stops and supergravity causes the star to implode. This is called a supernova and will shine brighter than any galaxy for a short time. It is this explosion, this extreme gravity and heat that fuses other elements together to form the heavier elements of the periodic table. Elements such as gold and lead and platinum as well as all sorts of exotic elements. So members wearing any kind of precious metals, is it not amazing to think that these trinkets that you wear began life at the center of an exploding star? The periodic table, also known as the periodic table of elements, is a tabular display of chemical elements, which is arranged by atomic number, electronic configuration, and recurring 
chemical properties. The structure of the, the table shows periodic trends. The seven rows of the table are called periods and the columns uh, uh, and, uh, with, with metals on the left and no metals on the right. And the columns are called groups, contain elements with similar uh, chemical behaviours. Column one, uh, for example, houses hydrogen and the alkali metals. These alkali metals are extremely reactive because they have one electron in their outer valency shell. I knew you knew that, Deputy Presiding Officer, which is a relatively weak bond with its positively charged nucleus. Elements like lithium and sodium and potassium. It's not difficult to excite these outer negatively charged electron to leave its host. And when it does, it does so quite energetically. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to drop a piece of potassium into water. It's absolutely worth a go. Sodium street lights are basically just passing electricity through sodium, exciting the outer electron to leave its host and give off energy in the form of light. And if you look at the other end of the spectrum, those elements with valency shells that are almost full, fluorine and chlorine and bromine and iodine, they do exactly the opposite. They are trying to fill uh, their almost full shells. And along comes a hydrogen atom with its one electron, and boom, they cuddle up and form elements such as hydrogen chloride, which is in its aqueous form is hydrochloric acid. This is an exothermic reaction, and it gives, which gives out heat. So if you ever want to impress your kids or grandkids, then what do you do is you take some bicarbonate of soda and you drop it into vinegar in a glass and it effervesces and you can feel the heat. As I already mentioned in column eight, the inert gases or halogen gases have full valency shells, such as helium and neon and argon and krypton, which is a personal favorite of Superman here. And there are 118 elements known today, uh, and, 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 and most of these uh, elements occur in nature, but as has already been said by Ian Gray, synthet some, some synthetic elements uh, are built in the lab. And it was actually December the 30th, 2015, Mr Gray, that the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry announced and officially recognised elements with atomic numbers 115, 117, 118, with organosone being the heaviest. These elements are synthesized by slamming lighter nuclei into each other and tracking the decay of super heavyweight elements uh, which are subsequently produced. And these may only exist for a fraction of a second, Deputy Presiding Officer, but it's sufficient to give them official recognition. So when Russian chemistry professor Dmitry Medlev first produced a version of the periodic table in 1869, he was clever enough to recognize he must leave space for elements yet to be discovered. And he was proven right. So how many elements could there possibly be? I hear you cry, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm glad you asked. The Bohr model exhibit, exhibits difficulty for atoms with atomic numbers greater than 137, as, as uh, elements with that atomic number would require the outer valency of electrons to be traveling faster than the speed of light, which is, by Einstein's special theory of relativity, is impossible. But they are now hypothesizing that the outer electrons may not need to circumnavigate the nucleus, but merely oscillate, which opens up a whole new series of possibilities. Deputy Presiding Officer, I never got the chance to talk about Rutherford's work in splitting the atom or Mosley's work with X-ray spectroscopy. But what I am seeing, Deputy Presiding Officer, in chemistry and other STEM subjects are far from being dry and uninteresting. On the contrary, studying them opens up the universe. As Ian Gray's motion says, let's invest in STEM subjects and ensure that Scotland's young minds continue to be at the forefront of discovery. Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, 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 a whole new Brian Whittle uh, appears before us, uh, more animated than I've ever seen you before. Uh, and that's saying something. Uh, Mr MacArthur, to be followed by Jackie Bailey. I think this will just be the same old Liam MacArthur, Deputy Presiding Officer, and after that contribution, I fear that mine will represent um, uh, effectively a handbrake turn. But can I uh, start by thanking Ian Gray for securing the debate uh, uh, on one of the most significant achievements in science and indeed introducing us to the concept of chemistry through crochet which is a craze that surely uh, will sweep the nation um, from here on in. Uh, can I also thank my colleague Alex Cole Hamilton's father David uh, for providing me with the wherewithal to contribute uh, to this evening's debate and, and Ian Gray started by uh, reflecting on what some of his former uh, teaching colleagues might have uh, thought of him bringing this debate uh, to uh, Parliament. I can only hazard a guess at the um, state of mild shock amongst all the science uh, staff in the Cutwell Grammar School circa 1985 at the notion that I am participating in it. 
but anyway, the, since uh, Mendeleev ordered the first elements into his table 150 years ago, the periodic table has evolved into a resource that has furthered our understanding of the world around us probably more than even he could have imagined at the time. For many of us, it was probably part of the wallpaper in the science classrooms up and down the country. However, in reality, the periodic table serves as the underpinning of modern day scientific research and offers clues as to how our world might best function. Take something as simple as our everyday mobile phones, the smartphones we rely on are home to 31 elements. Uh, don't ask me to name any of them off by heart, Deputy Presiding Officer, but when we upgrade our phones, we are effectively putting those elements in our old phones to waste. They either get stored away in a drawer at home uh, where the elements cannot be recovered, or they are handed in and end up often in third world countries where they are mined using strong acid uh, to retrieve those elements. And, and many of them are already fast running out, including small earth elements such as terbium. Yet extraction can have damaging environmental impacts, including water, air and soil pollution. We should recognise this and ensure that the UK takes the lead in more uh, ethical recycling, both in the interests of our environment, but also our continuing need for these naturally occurring but finite elements. Another e everyday item that we would do well to uh, appreciate more and waste less are lithium batteries, as Stuart Stevenson reminded us. Um, these are fundamental to uh, electric vehicles, and as Scotland rightly sets ambitious targets for massively increasing electric car use, with Orkney leading the way, of course, the demand for lithium-ion uh, batteries is likely to grow exponentially. They contain valuable materials such as cobalt, nickel and manganese, as well as lithium. And while there is enough lithium for all the cars we will need to manufacture, it needs to be recycled. And as of yet, we don't, still don't have an efficient system for doing that. In addition, cobalt uh, mainly comes from the uh, DRC, where it is often mined under, uh, again, as Ian Gray described, dreadful conditions uh, and often by children. The OECD has not yet deemed cobalt uh, uh, ores as conflict minerals, uh, but there are many who argue it should and it is hard to disagree. Technology undoubtedly can help us meet the challenging climate change ambitions we have set, but in turn, we need to ensure that we act sustainably and responsibly in the use of that technology and the elements that underpin it. Deputy Presiding Officer, in these days of fast-paced change, it is strangely reassuring to think that something that was created 150 years ago is still the template that helps to shape our present and indeed our future. It is absolutely right, therefore, that we take time to recognise the significance of the periodic table, uh, the debt we owe uh, Dmitry Mendeleev, and to a slightly lesser extent, the debt we owe Ian Gray for providing us an opportunity to put that gratitude uh, on the record this evening. But again, I, I thank Ian Gray and look forward to the remainder of the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms McCartney. I call Jackie Bailey, last speaker of the Open Debate, Ms Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and let me too congratulate Ian Gray on securing time for this debate. I have to confess, though, that I didn't know that this was the year that had been designated by UNESCO as the International Year of the Periodic Table. I'm delighted that that is the case, because we've been treated this evening um, to many fascinating speeches. Mine will be considerably more pedestrian, but I have the name of all of my colleagues that I think would be particularly useful in the pub quiz team. But when thinking about the debate this morning, I was instantly taken back to my school days and the science classroom with the colorful periodic table that was emblazoned across the wall. And I had to print one off, presiding officer, just to remind myself um, of what I used to look at. Now, I'm not for a minute suggesting that my interest was more in the table than what my science teacher was trying to teach me, but many an afternoon was spent reciting and remembering as many as I could. Now, I tried my best, but couldn't remember them all, and certainly not in the right order, and I was clearly a rookie at doing this. But not so Tom Lehrer. I wondered who would be the first to mention him. I'm disappointed that my colleagues haven't done so. He was, of course, the American singer from the 60s that used to recite the periodic table to Gilbert and Sullivan. Members will be pleased to hear that I'm not proposing to do that tonight. Um, but I would invite members to watch his performance on YouTube. Chemistry students, I think, will find this a wonderful, if slightly amusing, learning tool. Now, we could have a whole other debate about your favorite element in the periodic table, and I'm worried that Brian Whittle might take me up on this, but let me mention one briefly. Gold. 
almost immune against corrosion, ductile, malleable, a conductor of electricity, it doesn't get oxidized. Gold is apparently a sign of wealth and beauty, and it's been central to lots of mythologies. The Incas referred to gold as the tears of the sun, while Homer, in his Odyssey, mentioned gold as the glory of the immortals. All I will say, presiding officer, is Christmas is coming, so you could do worse than shopping for some AU number 79 in the periodic table. But let me turn to more serious points already raised in this debate by Ian Gray and how we support STEM education. Because there are fewer young people taking chemistry at senior phase at school. Indeed, there seems to be a narrowing in subject choice for STEM subjects because of changes to the curriculum. That has an impact right through the system. If there are fewer candidates moving from the broad general education phase to senior phase at school, if there are fewer candidates progressing into STEM degree programs, and we don't have enough STEM teachers either, then we have a systemic problem. Now, I know the Parliament's Education and Skills Committee has called for an independent review of these challenges, and I hope the government will do so urgently. As well as ensuring that STEM subjects are available and encouraged throughout the learning journey, I think we can all agree that STEM subjects need to be taught early. Now, I visited a truly wonderful science hub some time ago at St. Patrick's Primary School in Dumbarton. A joint venture between Western Dumbartonshire Council and the Glasgow Science Centre, they redesigned the learning space, they made it fun, they did some professional learning for teachers, and they encouraged the young people, as young as primary one, to be inquisitive. The children are so engaged, it was wonderful to see. And as one put it, it's more exciting than the classroom. But these young people are the scientists and the innovators of the future. We need more of this in every primary school, and we need to support the chemistry and other science subjects in every school across Scotland. Presiding officer, let me congratulate the periodic table on its 150th anniversary, and also congratulate Ian Gray on bringing a very interesting debate to this chamber. Thank you very much, and I call on um, Richard Lockhead to close the government. Minister, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I can also uh, very much welcome this debate where we celebrate the International Year of the Periodic Table and thank Ian Gray for bringing this forward to Parliament and for the powerful points he made in his opening remarks uh, as well. And of course, it gives us all an opportunity to talk not just about the periodic table, but also highlight Scotland's culture of science, discovery and invention. Now, whilst, of course, I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate uh, on behalf of the Scottish Government, it does mean we are absent, of course, from the science and the Parliament event, which is taking place at the moment um, across the road in Dynamic Earth, where they're celebrating the achievements of young people, uh, and particularly those who have won prizes for outstanding performance in higher advanced higher education, uh, sorry, higher STEM subjects uh, in particular. So whilst Brian Whittle says there's not a huge number of MSPs in the chamber at the moment, hopefully that's because they're over there at the reception at the moment uh, in Dynamic Earth, where I was supposed to be speaking at the moment also. But I'm delighted to be here because it's a very important uh, subject to discuss uh, in Parliament. And of course, the annual event across the road in Dynamic Earth is organised by the Royal Society of Chemistry, and it does provide a good opportunity for the science sector to come together with MSPs to discuss uh, the issues that they are facing. Uh, we should, of course, welcome the RSC's work uh, in this area and the leading role they have taken during this year's activities to mark 2019 as UNESCO's International Year of the Periodic Table. I particularly welcome their work to highlight the issues around the sustainability of key elements, which Ian Gray and Liam MacArthur and others have mentioned. Uh, these are elements that are found in smartphones, laptops, tablets, and the rechargeable batteries they all depend upon uh, as well. And, of course, they are rare minerals and... Uh, there are many international debates uh, and sustainability debates surrounding that particular issue as well. Uh, Jackie Bailey mentioned gold. I think we should also mention strontium, which is number 38 in the periodic table, because that is a particular connection with uh, Scotland. Uh, that is named after strontium in Lochaber, and it was near there in 1790 that Adair Crawford and William Cruikshank discovered the mineral strontaneite, from which strontanium was later um, isolated. So there's a very direct Scottish connection with the periodic table. And of course, uh, Dimitri Mendiat leaves uh, the formulation of the periodic table back in 1869, which we're celebrating today. Uh, 
was 1869, and then of course it was a big story in the news just a few weeks ago where the headline said, periodic table found during routine cleaning at Scottish University may be world's oldest. And the chart believed to date to eight, back to 1885 was unearthed from a, a storage room in the chemistry building at the University of St Andrews. So that's said to date back to 1885, the world's oldest surviving copy of the periodic table, only 16 years after uh, it was put together by Mendeleev uh, himself as well. There were a number of issues that people mentioned I'll try and touch upon. I think firstly we should just talk about the importance of the chemical sector to Scotland because we're trying to inspire people to study chemistry and follow chemistry as a career. It's important to highlight the importance of that sector to the Scottish economy. Scotland does have a large and successful chemical sector with an annual turnover of £3.1 billion. That's a sector that employs 11,000 people. So we're very proud of a strong chemical sector in this, uh, this country. It's got an impressive history of being one of the country's largest manufacturing exporters as well, estimated at approximately £5.46 billion in 2017 and accounting for 6.7% of Scotland's total exports. And R&D expenditure on chemicals and chemical products and pharmaceuticals totaled £178.8 million in 2017, which is 14.3% of the overall total in Scotland. So that just highlights the economic importance of the chemicals sector. And Scotland's universities outperformed the rest of the UK when it comes to world leading and internationally excellent research in chemistry. We should remember that uh, as well. And importantly, if we are trying to attract people into chemistry jobs, we should remember there are high quality jobs in Scotland with salaries averaging £47,000 per year. And we should get that message out there to our young people uh, also. Ian Gray and Jackie Bailey and others spoke about the importance of ensuring the courses available and people are studying the courses uh, and teachers as well. We should remember it is not all doom and gloom. We have the second highest number of chemistry teachers in Scotland uh, in the last 10 years. So that is good news as well. And the higher pass rates have been stable since 2016 also. Indeed, since 2014, in terms of higher passes uh, in chemistry, there's been a 0.8% change only it's between 2019 and 2014, compared to a 4.5% change for STEM subjects as a whole. So chemistry is quite stable as well. And in 2017-18, there were 530 first degree uh, full-time equivalent entrants studying chemistry at Scottish higher education institutions. And in terms of Stuart Stevenson's point about the gender split for students and people studying um, chemistry, it's important to note that was pretty evenly split between male and female entrants at university as well. So the gender balance does seem to be improving uh, in terms of chemistry. Uh, we are also, as you know, trying to encourage more people to teach chemistry as well as study chemistry. Uh, we approved 107 STEM career changing bursaries in 2018-19 against a target of 100. And we are offering more of those bursaries this year to attract more people into teaching STEM subjects in our schools, including chemistry. And we have also seen a third more full-time equivalent students on engineering, science and maths courses at colleges uh, than we had back in 2006, 2007 uh, as well. And finally, 41% of all modern apprenticeships starts in 2018-19 were in STEM frameworks. So I take on board in terms of the STEM strategy, the importance of attracting uh, both genders, but people generally into studying STEM subjects, both at school and of course at college or university thereafter, or taking on apprenticeships as well. So uh, these are very important issues raised in this debate and we'll take on that uh, on board many of the issues, of course, also highlighted in the Education Committee's report just been published uh, into STEM uh, also uh, as part of our five year strategy that's in place. Uh, we have more opportunities, just in closing, to celebrate STEM subjects and chemistry in the future. I think it's really important that we take advantage of the COP26 event that's going to be taking place in Glasgow. We're going to have 30,000 delegates there for that important climate change event. And there'll be uh, hundreds of uh, political leaders and state leaders from across the world as well. So I think it's really important we use that as a platform to promote Scotland science and our STEM subjects and our amazing science heritage uh, and chemistry and in other fields as well. So uh, today is also a good opportunity to celebrate all of that. But just in closing, a rich history of discovery and invention 
coupled with our continuing track record of research excellence, continues to play a major part in Scotland being recognised as a science nation. And we'll soon have another opportunity to debate that in Parliament in the coming days as well. So uh, I thank Ian Gray for giving us another opportunity to celebrate that today by bringing forward today's debate. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting of Parliament.